Welcome back to the channel. Dane Scott from Dane Scott's Truckers Lounge. In this episode, we're going to continue with episode 14 on restoring Grasshopper, my 1966 Kenworth K100. We're going to show you some more paintwork. Almost done with the paintwork. I can't believe it. And we're starting to work on the exhaust, so you'll see some of that. And then I'm also going to share with you in this episode, and I promised this several uh, episodes ago, I'm going to uh, share some of Trucker Wars with you about the truck strikes through the 70s and I believe 83 um, and what was involved in that. So I hope you'll stick around town, enjoy the episode this week, and remember, don't forget to like and subscribe because that's what helps build the channel. YouTube watches that stuff and if they see that you guys are watching the videos and you're liking them and subscribing, they'll promote the channel and it'll grow. <laughs> Okay guys, check it out. I started replacing the black with brown. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it works a lot better than just the black and I can show you the difference right here, see? The brown goes with the greens better than the black. The black is a color all by itself and though it makes them pop, it's a little bit too much out of place, so I thought brown. There we go. Yeah, I think this is going to come out better. A lot better than it was after I wet sand it and put color on it. Oh yeah, much happier with that. And it's not even cleared yet. Yeah, so it was worth the effort. not heard? The second annual GMC Jamboree is right around the corner. It's going to be Saturday, June 1st, right here in Conneaut, Ohio. And the Days Inn, which is right across the road from where the show is, is giving a 10% discount. So if you uh, reserve your room, make sure you tell them that's why you're here and they'll give you the 10% discount. And also, Evergreen Lake Park campground which is right down the road only like a block 
is uh, also doing the same thing. They're going to give 10% discount on if you're camping, you're bringing a camper, or I know they rent cabins. So um, you better make your plans, you better get your reservations in because they're filling up and it's going to be bigger than last year. Last year was awesome. You guys made it happen. And so uh, everybody's like, are oh, you going to do it again? You're going to do it again? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to bring it to you again. And what it is, it's not just GMC's. GMC is the, what do you want to call, we're calling out GMC's and we're giving a prize to whichever GMC that the Boy Scouts pick out. Last year they picked out their favorite GMC and Truck World gave them a killer um, tool bag full of all kinds of goodies. And I'm pretty sure they're going to do it again this year. So, and, and their fuel is like 40 cents cheaper than the place across the road. So it's gonna be a killer day. And it starts at 10 a.m., goes to four, 10, four, good buddy. So I hope to see you there. It's exhaust time. Yep. We're going to come out. Angle. Angle down. Underneath. Up. And then the flex will be right here. Into the elbow. So several episodes back, uh, I promised you guys that um, I was going to share with you uh, sections or maybe the whole DVD about all the trucker strikes that took place in the U.S. back in the 70s. They started with a, I think a two-day shutdown or two-week shutdown, I can't remember, in December. And um, to see, you know, how the government would pay attention to, to their needs and... Um, to what the industry felt that they needed and they didn't congress didn't pay attention so in 74 in february of 74 right after that december of 73 they initiated the first trucker strike uh, that the nation had experienced and what i'm going to show you is this is right from uh mike parkhurst's dvd called trucker wars and i give all the credits to him and also in the credits below this is his material and he put together this, this DVD and he actually was the one that uh, planned and and initiated all these strikes the the strike of 74 I believe 79 and 83 um, and he was the editor of overdrive magazine I didn't realize that and then he also was involved with the moving on series he went on to be a producer and, and make uh, some movies, be involved in some trucker movies. And man, he just had his fingers in everything uh, in the trucking world back in the 70s and 80s. So um, what I'm going to show you is about 15 minutes of the beginning of the DVD. I hope you'll find it as interesting as I did, and especially because a lot of you guys lived it. You were working during these strikes and you went through it. So. Uh, this will kind of be like a deja vu segment for you and for those of us like me that uh, were just little kitties then. Um, it was very interesting uh, to watch this. So I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm going to give you, I think, 12 to 15 minutes in this episode and then we'll, we'll give you some more later on. So uh, grab another cup of coffee, pull up your easy chair, and watch Trucker Wars. <laughs> strike, a strike against rising fuel costs and shortages. There were scattered incidents of violence from coast to coast and some arrests. The Pennsylvania National Guard was put on alert. A federal judge in Cleveland ordered independent truckers to stop interfering with steel deliveries. The strike is nowhere near 100% effective, but it has interfered with deliveries of a number of commodities, including food and fuel. In New Jersey, the trucker strike added to the gasoline shortage. 
it prevented many service stations from taking delivery of their first February allocations. On back roads, small groups of truckers tried to stop those others still working. The strikers put up picket lines at four of the state's larger oil terminals, cutting off all deliveries from Shell, Amoco, Chevron, and Hess. Greetings. I'm Mike Parkhurst. What you've just seen is a preliminary look at what truckers can do when they're mad as hell and aren't going to take it anymore. This is a true story of the trucker shutdowns, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what the shutdowns helped us to do to improve and revolutionize the entire trucking industry. Thanks for watching. How did the first trucker shutdown really happen? What caused it? Well, here are the facts. In the summer of 1973, in the country of Chile, 45,000 owner-operator truckers shut down in protest to the communist dictator Allende, and they were followed by women, housewives, carrying and banging their pots and pans, which was called the Pots and Pans Brigade. They caused a complete revolution in the country of Chile. The dictator was assassinated, and they got a new government. Unfortunately, not a good new government. So I used that, frankly, as a means to tweak the truckers' interest in what they could actually do. And in the October issue of my magazine, Overdrive, I explained what the truckers in Chile did. And then the next issue, the November issue, I had my great artist, Paul Geppner, draw a big machine that I called a vacander trucking man. Awaken trucker men. And that explained what we had done with my magazine and my association, Roadmasters, and the Independent Truckers Association, several years before with a steel hauler strike, which we helped to organize. So by tweaking the truckers' interest in the power that they had, hidden power, I thought we should explain it, and then we could have a shutdown if necessary. So on December the 3rd, 1973, a trucker and his wife, John and Susie Glendening from Indiana came to my office and I told them, unfortunately, we're gonna have to shut down. They were so thrilled, they asked to use our phone to call some friends back east. They did and said, guess what? Overdrive and Roadmasters are going to organize a shutdown. The word spread like wildfire. We're trying to put on a little pressure uh, to get someone to notice our point of view, get someone in Washington to realize what's happening to us and maybe help us a little bit. It seemed to me at the time that it would be irresponsible to just call for a big nationwide trucker shutdown with no end in sight. So I thought that it would be appropriate to have a very short two-day shutdown, which we scheduled for December 13 and 14. The reason I picked those days was because it was the anniversary of the planning of the Boston Tea Party. And that was my little inside 
joke, you might say. But a two-day shutdown would show Congress that truckers were serious about shutting down. And also, a very short two-day shutdown would not interfere with the Christmas deliveries. I didn't want little Johnny to be mad at truckers because his bicycle wasn't delivered either by truckers or Santa Claus. So we had a two-day shutdown, which frankly was a little bit more than two days because some truckers shut down earlier in December when they heard the word. But basically, we had a two-day shutdown that was a shot across the bow for the Congress. And then we placed a big ad in the Washington Post explaining the needs of the truckers. And we hand-delivered reprints of that ad to every single member of Congress, all 535 of them, everybody at the DOT, and the 11 ICC commissioners, so they would know that we were serious, that January 31st, coming up, a bigger, longer shutdown would happen. Unfortunately, as we all know, Congress does not react to problems. They only react to a crisis. So, in spite of the warnings, in spite of the proof, they did nothing. Nothing. New Jersey gasoline stations were already in trouble. Lines were long at the few stations that were open. Because of the trucker's strike, the gas situation was becoming even worse. In Ohio, where a lot of the earlier protests were centered, fewer trucks than usual were on the road. Many of those traveled in groups of three or four to protect each other from striking drivers who might try to stop them. In Akron, truckers were given police protection. Some who stayed on the job, most of them drivers for big trucking companies, said they sympathized with those on strike, but they also said their bosses had told them, either work or lose your job. The economic effects of the strike are not yet serious, but they're building. In Cleveland, drivers for a big supermarket chain walked out, closing down warehouses. If the strike goes on, 80 supermarkets in Ohio may run out of food. In Southern California, the independent truckers set up their blockades last night. Los Angeles County was the focal point. They rolled their rigs into several large diesel terminals and parked. They were still there today, although truck traffic on the highways looked normal. The protesting drivers say they'll stay until they get lower fuel prices and higher speed limits. There was no violence, and station operators generally were sympathetic. So the stations stayed closed, blockaded, all day. The drivers, with nothing to do, stayed close to their trucks. From time to time, leaders showed up to give them progress reports. Ontario 500 foot stop this morning was shut down. A spokesman claimed the Los Angeles shutdown was 90% effective, with 250 independent owner-operators taking part. But thousands of trucks were still on the road, although the blockades made it hard for the other drivers to find fuel. Good evening. Federal and state officials and representatives of the independent truckers of this nation have met in Washington in an attempt to end the truckers' protest that has now spread to 26 states. The protest has already created violence on the highways, unemployment, and the shutdown of businesses dependent on trucking. What the truckers desire simply cannot be implemented without congressional action. A return to work can now prevent a national economic calamity that would, by its impact, adversely affect every truck driver as well as every other working man and woman in this nation. The return to work now by the independent truck drivers would prevent the spread of violence. They could only lead to an adverse public climate that would make it more difficult for government officials to cooperate with the truck drivers in achieving their goals. The truckers' initial response to the moratorium request was not favorable. As the talks went on in Washington today, Ohio's Governor John Gilligan ordered 900 National Guardsmen to duty patrolling state highways and protecting the truckers who are still working. In Pennsylvania, since last Wednesday, there have been 14 shooting incidents and 63 reports of damage. In Pennsylvania, state officials today doubled the number of National Guardsmen on duty. They watched highways and overpasses in bitter cold weather. Traffic was light. The few trucks that were moving traveled in groups for protection. 
reports of scattered gunshots, and one driver was forced to abandon his rig. It could get worse tonight when truck traffic would normally pick up. This evening, the Pennsylvania National Guard is out in double the numbers of the past few days, waiting, waiting to see what will happen as truck traffic resumes and the first big test comes of the trucker's strike. In Illinois, despite scattered reports of violence, the truck strike remains relatively calm. This truck stop is one of a few still open in the state. Here, business is down about 80%, and right now there are no plans to close the stop despite the business losses. In Indiana, few trucks are on the road. The drivers say it's virtually impossible to get diesel fuel. The strike has been that effective. This stop was open until this afternoon. It closed after only two drivers had stopped for fuel in one 12-hour period. Period. Police patrol the stop on a regular basis. The truck drivers who are staying here during the strike say they want no violence. So far, there has been none. The truckers say they will stay off the road until the government meets their demands, which include lower fuel prices. It's ironic that this stop raised its diesel fuel prices five cents per gallon just today. William Saxby, the new United States Attorney General, said today, Governors, city and county officials must move against trucker violence before hundreds are killed on the highways. He said this handful of truckers is not going to bring the country to its knees, but he added if the governors don't have the guts to face up to the situation, it will get worse. It's had its effect on the delivery of gasoline. Some schools in remote rural areas today had to close because they couldn't get gas for their buses. Also, filling stations in many areas reported long lines. In Washington, Federal Energy Chief William Simon said one way to eliminate the lines and panic buying is for motorists not to buy gas unless they need at least $3 worth. He didn't suggest what to do if the station won't sell that much. He did say he might make a minimum sale mandatory when and if Congress gives him the authority to do so. Some of the longest gas lines have been in the heart of the East Coast's biggest refinery district, in and around the city of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Supplies are so low there that the mayor has set up New Jersey's first distribution plan. Like Oregon and Hawaii, motorists with even-numbered license plates get gas on even-numbered calendar days and vice versa. There appears to be no consensus among striking truck drivers on that tentative settlement worked out yesterday in Washington. There were more trucks on the road today, and some industries which had been on the brink of closing got fresh supplies. But many truckers say they won't accept the settlement, and violence, which has accompanied the shutdown from the beginning, continued with new incidents in 15 states. Here in Washington, leading administration officials met with President Nixon to review the situation. We have reports first from ABC White House correspondent Tom Jarrow. The president, under criticism for not being more personally involved in the trucker strike, met for 45 minutes with federal officials who have been in the front lines of the negotiations. The so-called interagency task force has the dual assignment of implementing terms of the tentative agreement and punishing strikers who may have broken the law. Chief negotiator William Ussery is hopeful the truckers will buy the deal they've been offered, and he reported limited progress today. Energy Chief William Simon, who's also promoting the settlement, reported his office is moving to stop price gouging and wants 100% of the truckers' fuel needs met. Simon, however, will not yield on the truckers' number one demand for a diesel price rollback. While bureaucrats and sellout artists were huddled around other politicians in Washington, back in Los Angeles at the Overdrive Independent Truckers Association headquarters, we had a communication headquarters where we were mapping out what was happening all over the country. We were getting five to 6,000 telephone calls a day. We had two round-the-clock operators taking calls, taking notes, and writing up what truckers were saying, including the fact that there were 200 fully loaded oil tankers anchored off every single port city in the United States waiting for the prices to rise. Yet Bill Simon, who became the Treasury Secretary, said basically, oh, we can't do anything about the prices. Okay, guys and gals, gals and guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'll give you more of the DVD in uh, a future episode unless uh, YouTube gives me a problem. I don't know. I've given credits down below for uh, 
the Trucker Wars DVD, which is by Hollywood Continental Films. And uh, so maybe they'll have a problem with that. I don't know if there'll be copyright problems. If there is, um, I'll just let you guys know and you can try and grab a copy of this. Check eBay or whatever, but very informational and uh, I enjoyed this immensely, especially the footage of the old trucks and everything. And I realized the quality wasn't the greatest. It's not the greatest on here, but it, it was worse because I was just filming my TV. So I'm sorry about that, but at least you guys are getting the uh, the whole information and the whole uh, brunt of it anyways. So uh, get your own copy then. All right, so that's going to wrap it up this week. So make sure you like and to subscribe and watch the videos. Let them play through. And uh, next time, we'll see you. But until then, keep the hammer down. Safe and sound. Ready to rock, Jack Wombo? Yeah, thank you.